Uh, here we are at the Boston International Book Fair. It's November 15th, 2014. And our first interview of this session is with Forrest Proper of Jocelyn Hill Rare Books. Forrest, welcome to our, our program, you. as Thank it you. is. Jocelyn Hall. <laughs> Jocelyn Hall, yes. H-A-L-L. -L. Well, I got that right. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do is to ask people, everybody we interview, uh, about their family background, uh, where they went to school, siblings, uh, are you married, single, do you have children, et cetera. So give us a little biography, uh, a sketch of you from the time you were, uh, like say, in high school and up. Okay, yeah. Um, I was born in Keene, New Hampshire to uh, parents who were teachers and grandparents who were teachers and aunts and uncles who were teachers and um, moved to eastern Massachusetts around uh, grade school time and, and grew up in Concord, actually. Um, and then um, graduated high school in three years because I was bored with it. Ah. And uh, my guidance counselor said, okay, fine, you've got, you got enough credits. Take a year off, do your writing, do whatever you want to do, but apply to college. Because I've found that people who don't, who take a year off and don't apply to college often don't go. And I said, oh, that won't be me. And I ab ended up being an abject lesson in the listen to your guidance counselor. Because yeah. uh, I got into the art and antique business instead and then slipped into books somehow. Where did you start your art and antique business? Uh, out of the garage, basically. Where? In, oh, oh, in Concord. In Concord. In Concord, yeah. And so you slid from there. What made you slide from art and antique into, into the book art? Well, we, we were doing art and antique shows, and I noticed that every one of those has a reference book dealer. And he always seemed to be doing really well, because when it was a good show and the dealers were flush with cash, they'd go over and buy books for reference. And when it was a bad show, they'd be bored out of their skulls. And this was back in the day before they all had handhelds and things to yeah. amuse themselves. And so they'd go buy books. Um, and I thought, that's a good deal. I could get a piece of that. <laughs> and about that time, the, the dealer who did a lot of Eastern Massachusetts and New England shows was quitting to go back to law school. And so there was a slot opened. And so we decided, OK, let's become book dealers. And um, we did. And then did new books. for five or six years. In a shop? Uh, we had a store up in, uh, it was more of a, a convenience, it was up in Malden, which was a convenience because we were doing shows, 30 or 40 shows a year and a lot of mail order. My God, 30 to 40 shows a year, it's, it's <laughs> mind boggling. I don't even want to do one show a year. <laughs> well, um, what about siblings? I have no siblings. Okay, yeah. uh, are you married? Yes. yes. Children? No, no. we what have cats. You? Okay, maybe you're better off, I don't know. But uh, what does your wife do? Uh, she actually works with the business now. She was a, a custom black and white photographer when we lived in Eastern Massachusetts. We moved out to Western Mass about eight years ago now. And she had a lab, uh, a studio, in the photo district in South Boston. Oh, right, I know that area yeah. pretty well. Yeah. Uh, they used to have some wonderful design shows uh, up in there. Um, when you slid into the book business, what year was that? Be the uh, early 80s. Early 80s. Were you a computer person at that stage of the game? We got, we got one of the first, if you remember the um, uh, uh, IBM ads with Charlie Chaplin and oh. the first <laughs> IBM machines, we got one of those, yes. And we used cool. it for inventory and catalog creation and things like that. During that time, uh, well, how would you characterize your business? Was it mostly an internet business? Was it mostly a shop business? Was it mostly a dealer business? Yeah, well, it was because we were selling reference books. We, uh, we were taking advantage. I, about the same time we got into this, I read a book by Peter Drucker called Innovation and Entrepreneurship, which said, look for dichotomies in the marketplace. And we'd been doing book fairs. I love books. We'd go to book fairs, and I'd notice books on art and antiques were at book fairs, very cheap, because you can't sell them at book fairs. No, usually not. Yeah. And so the dealers were great, uh, glad to get rid of them. But if you go to art and antique shows with them for sale, that's where people want them. And so we had a foot in both uh, places. And so we were exploiting that dichotomy in the business. I'd buy at book fairs and sell at antique yeah. fairs. And this was, this was the beginning of you in the 80s? In the this early is the mid-80s by this point, yeah. In the mid-80s. Yeah. Um, Okay, you you have a long history of teachers in yeah. your in your family uh, <laughs> genealogy, and I would presume that um, they had some influence on you uh, and your book activities. 
Yeah, I mean, I grew up thinking that it was normal to have a house filled with thousands and thousands of books. This seemed yeah. complete. And I would go to friends' houses, and there wouldn't be any books around. And I thought, that's a little odd. Yeah. Um, and I also, what got just shown to me is that if you sit still for more than 30 seconds or 40 seconds, it's utterly normal to pick up a book and start reading it. And that's you a normal had an activity. Excellent family background. Uh, my father used to read these pulp westerns, and when he was through with them, he you know put them on the table, and then I would sneak them in the room and, yeah. and read them. But you know, if you grow up with books, it's a good thing. It's hmm. always a good thing to grow up with books. Um, who would you consider to be some of your mentors when you first started in the trade? Or, um, did, you, or did you not have anyone you went to as a, for advice, et cetera? That, that's a good question. But Doug Harding up in Wells, Maine, made an interesting observation because he has a good section in uh, art and antiques, and we would go up there. And this was back, this was before the internet. Yeah. So to get stock, you had to go to book fairs, or you went and we had a, a circle of bookstores that we yeah, went to. And, scouting. Yeah. And, and he said, we were talking about our specialty, which was reference books. And he said, yeah, it's a lot easier to sell one book for $1,000 if it's really rare than it is to sell 10 books for $100. And we'd been selling the 10 books for $100 a lot at that point, or 20 books for $15, $25. Uh, I thought, yeah, gee, you know, that's a profound point. I can do something with that point. And so we started to branch out from the out of print type of reference books and look for the rarer material, the older material, 17th and 18th century design, which have a bearing and direct in, uh, go in with the art and antique reference uh, genre, but which are slightly more sophisticated and more interesting, because I get bored easily. <coughs> and and at, after a certain time, I got tired just churning the reference books over and over and over. It can be a drag, can it? Yeah, yeah. But the, Doug has made some pretty profound statements in his life. I asked him once, uh, what do you think the most important thing to do if you're going into the book business? He said, own your own building. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's a man of few words, but they're, they're, they're pretty important <laughs> words. Um, were there any other booksellers that you can recall who were possibly influential in your, in your career? Charlie Wood was, uh, because I, I, early on I found some of his catalogs. And he does wonderful catalogs and, and a lot of research and just great scholarship in what he presents. And it, it showed me, and we were beginning to do printed catalogs at that point, that it, it really, there's an art to doing the research and presenting it in, oh, a, yeah. in a catalog. And the catalog itself becomes collectible eventually. Um, well, yeah, I, I would think people in, in your field, there are certain dealers whose catalogs you want to keep. Mm. Same for me for Western Americana. I, yeah. You just need to have that kind of thing. And so when did you first get, what year did you get your, become computerized? Uh, what year did they do the Charlie Chaplin? Late 80s, early 90s, Late something 80s, like that. Late 80s, early 90s. And um, you were a little bit late when yeah. in, in terms of uh, when, when computers started to really Probably, probably late 80s um, because we were on computers for a number of years and then the internet came along and right. that would probably be about 94, 95 that we got onto the internet. Uh, stand, right now, as things stand, what, what do you? What percentage of your business is internet business? What percentage of your business is uh, book shows? What percentage of your business is mail order? Just rough figures. Just rough figures. We probably do um, 60, 50 or 60 percent on the internet, and the rest through catalogs. Um, we're getting back into book fairs. We did a lot of book fairs. Um, in the 90s, regionals. early 2000s. Regionals and ABA fairs yeah. uh, do the New York Book Fair and the Boston Book Fair and, and, and so on, and then dropped them um, for a while to mm -hmm. concentrate on, well, for a variety of reasons. Um, and then the, the internet was changing the business very, very much. Yeah. Um, and now that the business has changed again, um, with the reference book business basically being dead on the ground, uh, we're getting back into the fairs, um, but probably about 50-50, and the fairs are an adjunct to that, which we hope to grow over time. Well, there's certainly enough regional fairs to go around. There are uh, not as many as there used to be, though. Well, I mean, it, it used to be, I mean, when we were buying 
reference books at regional fairs. There would be, there were half a dozen down in Connecticut. Yeah. And there would be There was a proliferation of yeah. them. And, and now it's, uh, well, uh, there are some new enterprising people in the, in the uh, show business. Mm -hmm. And I understand there's going to be two or three book fairs in New York at the same time. Three, I guess, yeah. Uh, That'll so be interesting. I, I think that's, you know, a bookseller's paradise in a sense. You get three places to go and look for stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, if you can't afford New York, you just go in for the day, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Talk a little bit about the aspects of the trade that have changed since you first got in it and where we are today. It's changed completely. I mean, it, it's interesting. In a way, it's changed completely, and in a way, it's exactly the same, right. because the point of it is to find a book that has value that other people don't recognize, or that for some reason they decided they knew it had value, but they can't exploit it, and to do your research and represent it. Um, as, as I think he had in cons, is to put it in context. Yeah. Contextualize, and that's more important than ever, um, because you're competing. And that's the thing that the internet has done, is it has uh, leveled the playing field. But if, you, if you're just selling a run-of-the-mill book, anyone can go up on Amazon and find 75 other copies of it, yeah. and you've got to either decide that that's a book I'm no longer going to carry, or that there is some reason that my copy is more important or more desirable than those other copies. Or, and, or and it's the cheapest. Or it's the cheapest. Yeah, but that, uh, and if you want to go down that road, there's, there's a road yeah. that people can go on to. Absolutely. There, there's software yeah. available where you can, or you can be 50 cents lower than anybody else. There is, but and I get bored constant. easily, so we don't, I, yeah, <laughs> we don't I, do that. Uh, but but. You know, there are places that have oh, yeah. that kind of a software. Oh, yeah. uh, when you talk about uh, reference books, I remember when I first started in the trade, people said to me, oh, reference books, my God, they'll make you money, and someday it'll be your retirement fund. Well, that's really been screwed up. That's really it? screwed up, yeah. <laughs> I mean, God. I, I often wonder how Oak Knoll uh, does, but he does very well. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's one of the things I was thinking about this on the way in, in, in that more than ever it pays to specialize these days. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's how people like that survive when other people selling reference books don't, is if you're, if you're really specialized, you'll know your business enough that you can find a way to make it work. Yeah. Um, but if you're not, it's a hard, hard slog. The generalist is really up against it, yeah. if you think yeah. about it. Although it's, it's interesting. We've changed, we're changing our business somewhat, because as I said, the reference books are going down in flames. And so we're, we're going back to what Doug was talking about, which is the really spec the thousand dollar book that has, there's some reason that you want this book. And it's a great time to be a specialist because the internet, the one thing that the big change the internet has brought for the better is it's so much easier to research things, mm -hmm. um, people or, or, or events or whatever. Whereas if you reached for one reason or another, we were researching a civil war soldier and you might have spent months digging yeah. through regimentals, and now you can Google the guy and, and find, find out everything. The, yeah, uh, find out everything in five minutes. That's and that's a, a great a boon. Yeah. And it, it makes, in a way, it makes the generalist's world a little easier because they can contextualize what they have easily um, and then find that hook and find, find that thing that will allow them the to hook. say, this is a special piece. This is why you need to buy this piece. Right. Um, and so in that way, the internet has given and the internet has taken away. It's made, it, it's made books ubiquitous and a lot of books harder to sell. But it's also given us the tools to, to point out why this book is special and your life will be better if you buy this book from me. So. That's uh, well said. Your life will be better. <laughs> I wonder sometimes. <laughs> um, was it a difficult uh, situation for you to transition into computers uh, uh, when the internet came out? Did you find that a, an easy transition? Because you had already been hmm. computerized before that. So you must have just like... It was fairly easy. It was fairly easy. I mean, it's been interesting because we were in it. I mean, I remember the very, that there were, had, had been a couple services whose names I do not remember that came along before Interlock 
which is now a service that no one remembers. But Interlock yeah. was the cutting edge there for a while. Well, that became a Libris. Uh, that it? became a Libris through a, a series of convolutions. Yeah. Um, and I remember when, when the Seltzers started Bibliofind, and you could mail them a disk with your inventory through yeah. the mail, and they wow. would upload it themselves. Um, <laughs> how I mean, the world has changed. How the world has changed. That's, well, that's amazing, isn't it? Um, if you were entering the book trade today, uh, the question I always ask is, would you, could you? Oh, I, oh, I would. I would. I, uh, yeah, you can. Because the internet, as I say, the net has given you the ability to, to research and contextualize. I think you have to have some background. I think, well, no, you don't. Because you see people at the books, at library book sales, you see them with their little handhelds scanning barcodes. barcodes and yeah. you can get into the business if that's what you want to do. People make a living at it. It's not. It would bore the. Yeah, it would me bore so. me to death. Yeah. But you can do it. But mm -hmm. if you have a, if you have, I think that's where reading comes back into it. If you have, I read a lot of history, and so our stock tends to t is going histor it's historical material, because I know a lot of history, and I can look at something and say, oh yeah, there's a hook to that. You know, I know why this piece is important and that piece isn't. That's um, important. And, right and so if you could, if you, if it's. It's not an easy business to get into, but if you have a good eye, there's a lot of material at the fairs and in stores and on the internet. There's a lot of material out there that's underpriced because it's unrecognized. Uh -huh. And if you've got the time and the inclination to do it, yeah, it's it's a good business to get into. Trolling the internet is, can be fun and it can be profitable. It can be a it can be a black hole of time suck, but it can be fun and profitable. Oh God, yeah, yeah. yeah I'll, on eBay, I'll get going looking at stuff, and you go from thing to thing to thing. And then suddenly, bing, bing, bing. Oh, wait a minute. That's vastly underpriced, and I need that. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, there's certainly no dearth of material hmm. that one can look at in order to. I think that's probably the main reason why uh, going around New England these days, there's a bookshop here and a bookshop there instead of a bookshop, a bookshop, a bookshop, yeah. then yeah. a bookshop, another. One. I remember the good old days, if you want to call them good, when there was probably 100 open bookstores in New England. We used to do a lot of traveling. I mean, I would have, you would, the Vermont Book Fair. Vermont yeah. Book Fair was in July, and I would have a little route, and I would take two or three days and saunter up one way and saunter back down the other way, and there were a dozen shops that I would stop at, and probably not more than one or two of them are left now. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, it's really, uh, it really is a blow to those of us who were sort of brought up on the trail. Mm -hmm. We're having to find a new way to acquire material that's a little bit alien to us. It's, it's interesting because, of course, you lose a lot of the personal contacts because you see yeah. these people a couple times a year. You run into them at book fairs and you say hi and you catch yeah. up. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, I know people from other parts of the country that I didn't get to before. Right. I mean, unless you're, like, again, like Doug Harding who at least at that time would take, what, a month or two off to do the he California take, book fair, and he, he had a route he drove. Now he said he just drives straight out and straight back because yeah. he says there are no places to stop The anymore. stores aren't there anymore, yeah. But he does stay out there for two months. Um, I, env I envy that. I'd, I'd yeah, like that's great. I'd like that's to sit in the sun for two and months. It's a good time not there. to be in Maine. Yeah, um, <laughs> not to be any place in New England. But if, but if you can't do that, now you can, you, I have contacts with dealers in other parts of the country that I never would have gone to right. via the internet. We may not meet in person very much, but I know them sort of, and we have a business relationship, and that wouldn't have been around no. before we were online. No, you would have had to root them out. There were no, yeah. there were no, none of these little directories of, of who's in the area. There right. were none of these, you know, so-called branches. Uh, you would just have to get on the road and use your AB. Yeah, yes. And which a, a, a B, by the way, for people who came along within the past five years. <laughs> it, 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 it was the Bible oh, yeah. in its day. And you would call up and say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a trip to Ohio. And he would send you a note with all the dealers in Ohio who use, his book, who hmm. use the AB. Hmm. And it was amazing what you would yeah. find. You can't do that nowadays. Yeah. There is no more AB or anything like it. Um, what do you see as some of the great challenges we face as booksellers? going forward in the next five or 10 or 15 years? I think you've got to keep up. I mean, I, I think Ian, another person who's had a great influence on me since the internet came along is Ian Kahn, who's on the cutting edge of everything. Yeah, he, apparently. <laughs> you keep hearing that name. He got me on Facebook. He got me on Twitter. 
which was, <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure I thank him for that. But, uh, but he got me on Facebook, yeah. which Facebook's is wonderful, um, yeah. uh, not only person, but for business. Yeah. Um, and you, it, it's important, I think, to keep your eyes open and keep up and not just simply reject or, or be a, a, a not inclined to take part in these new things that are coming along and who knows what it's going to be tomorrow. Yeah. There's no way of telling. Um, and and it, the hardest thing is to fight against that ubiquity that books have taken on. That there are just books everywhere and the same copy everywhere. And it's I'm so much it. harder. Um, I mean, I, I used to, when I didn't go to college, I used to think, well, okay, I don't have a degree, but I'll always be able to make a living of some sort selling, buying and selling rare books yeah. because there was that you had to have the knowledge in your head. Uh, and now people have it on their handheld. Mm. And so that safety net's a little bit gone. It's much harder in a way to make a living selling books now. I uh, remember that Leona Rostenberg used to tell me that she worked for, uh, in Germany for a very uh, mean and, and rotten German dealer who is no longer with us, but I don't remember his name. But she used the term Finger uh, Gespräche, which means something to the effect of putting your hand on the book and mm. being able to price it. Well, you don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to do it. It's interesting, though. It's a good talent to have. Because yeah. the, the other thing I found with reference books on the internet is, yes, it made a lot of them ubiquitous. And it taught us that this book, which you might have run into every six months, now you get 47 copies tomorrow. Mm. But it also showed us what's actually rare. Right. And you no longer have to guess at that. If there's no copies today, and you look again next month and there are still no copies and still no copies for six months and you use a wonderful tool like Via Libri. Um, that's actually a rare book. And yeah. so, and, it, and of course the internet makes it easier to find it. If there is one out there, you can grab it via, via Libri or whatever. And you can now say authoritatively, that's actually a rare book. And I have, as a specialist, have some idea how rare it is. And although there are no comps on stuff like that, you still can use that sense of, I know how to price that because yeah. I know something about that field. That, yeah, that price it's an invaluable, looks awful low. Yeah, yeah. And I just, you, if, if you do it enough, you get the ingrained feeling that yeah. I know what the price point is, even though I can't look it up on the internet. Well, of course, the, the obverse of that situation is a lot of books that we thought were pretty scarce mm -hmm. have turned out to be fairly common. Oh, yeah. I mean, which is another bad yeah. thing for us. Common and cheaper. There's a book on federal furniture that is like the Bible. It was a book that we made a lot of money on over the years, and it got up to two hundred fifty dollars. And you can now sell it for thirty-five on Amazon if you can sell it. That's yeah. what it goes for. And then a lot of books have been uh, reprinted by uh, lots of different people out there. Mm -hmm. And then there's e-books. Uh, there's there's a lot of competition for text. Mm. But I still believe that there's no substitute for holding a physical object in your hand and getting the emotion that it takes to open up an 18th century map. How, oh, yeah. how do you do that on e-books? You can't do it on e-books. It's, it's interesting. I have a theory about how e-books are going to actually strengthen the rare book trade. And that is we, we had uh, someone who was looking for a certain topic. And he knew of a rare pamphlet we had that he had found because it was available as a download. Um, and it was wonderful for him because he could now have the text. But he wanted actually to hold the pamphlet in his hand. And before e-books came along, he wouldn't even have known the pamphlet existed. That's right. That's right. Um, and there's a certain, no, there will always be a certain number of collectors who not only want the text, but who having got the text then say, I'd really like the book. Yeah. And with the older books and the rarer books, that, that will be an advantage for us. Uh, it's just, uh, it takes some getting used to. Mm -hmm. For, for old timers like me. Um, who are some of the uh, rising stars in the trade? That, that we, I see an awful lot of young people with booths at mm -hmm. this book fair. And uh, some of them I know, some of them I don't know. But apparently there, there are some uh, pretty good people coming into the trade. It's interesting, and, and, and Facebook is where I've met a lot, and, and I know a lot of them on Facebook who actually at this fair are meeting for the first time in person. <laughs> uh, again, Ian Kahn is instrumental in that because he has such a wide circle of people. Certainly Brian Cassidy oh, Brian, uh, is really, great in, guy. and, and uh, I've known him for a while online and just met him for the first time in person yesterday. Uh, and he's certainly um, 
a model example of the modern young bookseller yeah. who knows what's going on and how to do it. Um, people, uh, B and B books, uh, yeah. Sunday Josh and Josh Sunday. And Sunday. Yeah. Um, my booth mate, Kara Asatola. Oh, Kara's great. Um, is another example of someone getting into the business who really has a feeling for where it's going and, yeah. and how to deal with it. Uh, I'm going to be interviewing her around 1.30 this mm. afternoon. So, yeah. we'll I mean, get, we'll one, one of the great things that I see these days is for a long time, and it, it may be something any, every generation does, is as you get older as a bookseller, you start to bemoan the lack of fresh new faces yeah. coming up. Yeah. Uh, and it may always have been like that, I don't know. But I know I've, I've hit about the point where I was beginning to say, ah, oh, yeah, but there's no new blood in the business. But now there is. Mm -hmm. And it's really, it's cool. I mean, the old saying used to be, oh, my God, it's too bad you got into the business now. You should have seen all the inventory <laughs> mm -hmm. that used to be. But, you know, these, it, it's always the same things over and over again. Yet people keep existing, people mm -hmm. keep making a living, and people keep rising as stars in the trade. Yeah. I can think of Lawn Bear as, mm -hmm. as, as one guy mm -hmm. who seems to be indefatigable right now, but, you know, too much you burn out. I already told him that. <laughs> um, let's see. I think I, I pretty much got to ask you everything that I wanted to ask you, um, except I'll ask you the same question I, I've asked Doug and a number of other people. What do you think is the most important thing someone needs to start into the book business today? Curiosity. Hmm. You need to, you need to, because otherwise, I, again, I get bored easily, so I need to be curious about what I'm doing. But you, you've got to, um, if you really want to make it, you've got to work that extra hour, you've got to find that extra fact, you've got to do the, that extra thing that will make people come to you and buy your books. And so you've got to be curious about them. Um, and that, that may just be because that's a trait that I value in people. But I really think that if you're not curious about where you can go and what you're dealing in and, and, and the background of it and, and just finding out that one little thing more about it, um, that may, being curious about these things is a huge, huge help. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm always interested in talking to people <coughs> who didn't go to college, but who have a wonderful grasp of what's going on and what they do, et cetera. And uh, I think you're one of those guys. Uh, oh, and you. I'm very happy to have you as an interview. And you know, if you think about it, we've just got through 30 minutes. Have and we? It didn't, didn't seem like that at all. <laughs> it did not. Well, thanks very much, Forrest. Appreciate it. And well, thank you. look forward to seeing you on the floor. Thank you. I'll see you there. Okay.